Man, it's good to be together this morning. It's great to sing with you this morning. We're going to sing again a little bit on the back end of the service too. But today is Resurrection Sunday. The tomb is empty. Jesus has risen. And friends, I mean this when I say this. That changes everything. Changes everything. What a beautiful day Easter is. Everyone dresses up. Joy is in the air. The ham is on the smoker. The nap is in the reclining chair later on. Today, it is a beautiful day. Plastic eggs in the backyard for the Easter egg hunts. I wish every day could be like Easter. I was telling that to my son this morning. I said, I said Trevor, for me, Easter, Easter, Easter is like the uh, NBA Finals Game 7. It's like the National Championship Game for college basketball. It's like the pinnacle day of the year. I wish every day was like Easter. But if you've been alive for like the last year, you know that not every day is filled with Easter eggs and gifts and presents and beautiful weather. It's just not the way it actually is. Especially in the last year, there have been days filled with unexpected challenges. There have been unexpected and unanticipated problems in the last days. There were days in the last year when everything seemed to be falling apart, when businesses shut down and sports seasons were canceled and schools were being closed. There were those kinds of days. There were days when people around you or even yourself were getting sick. There were days when people you loved faced death. There were days over the last year where where things were so dark for some of you that everything seemed to break and you lost your grip on what you thought you could count on, on what you thought you could trust, on what you thought you loved the most. It began to slip through your fingers and, and there was nothing you could do to stop it and the pastel world of Easter became very bleak and gray and black and dark. There were some really hard days over the last year. And so we carry a lot of fear from our past, and we carry a lot of fear of the unknown future with us into this day. We bring fears from the past with us, regrets. We bring fears of the unknown future and the uncertainty of the future, and we bring that into this room as we celebrate the risen Christ. And the more that I've lived and the more that I've studied the Bible and the more that I've observed just the frailty of life and how fragile everything is, the more convinced I am that the resurrection means everything for us. The more significant the resurrection becomes in my mind and in my heart. All of our hopes, all of your hopes for the future, like the long future, rest on the resurrection. All of it hinges on this event. Now, this sermon today, I'm I'm not going to try to give you sort of the, the preponderance of evidence, historical evidence, to try to convince you of the credibility of the resurrection as if you don't know that, you don't believe that, and I'm going to try to convince you or persuade you of that. That's not my goal for this sermon. I'm going to give you some evidence as we go. The evidence is substantial, But that is not my goal. My goal in coming together here as the church is to ask and answer the question, how does the knowledge of the resurrection help us? We we worship God. We glorify God for his greatness in in this miraculous event. I mean, sometimes the words can just come off of our lips and we just don't even think about it. Jesus rose from the dead. That just doesn't happen. But it did happen. What does it mean for us? What does the resurrection mean for us? How does it help us? How does it give us hope? And specifically, how does the resurrection of Jesus help put to rest the fears that we have? The fears of our past sins and the regrets and the guilt and the shame. And how does it help us conquer the uncertainty of the unknown future? That's what we're going to consider together this morning in this sermon. So if you have Bibles with you, you can open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to be in there mostly. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. The words are going to be on the screen. So just follow along with us. We're going to be in that section, and we're going to move our way through a little bit through it. Then we're going to move to a section in the book of Romans, and that'll be our message for the day. So pray with me one more time as, as we begin. Father, we thank you that you are in control of this whole world, and this day is a celebration of your sovereign power 
and your sovereign purposes. Lord, we, we believe that Jesus died according to your will for us. And he was raised again for us. Lord, would you teach us this morning not just what it means on paper, but God, I pray for every person in the room or listening online to this message that you would infuse hope into our hearts. You would infuse faith into our hearts that we would trust you with our past and we would trust you with our future knowing that Christ was raised from the dead for us. Give us that kind of confidence today so we could live it out, Lord, in this fearful world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First, the resurrection conquers fears, conquers fear of your sinful past. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 20, but this chapter, Paul, who's the author of this letter to the church in Corinth, he's making an argument and he's establishing the resurrection as the central source of hope for the Christian. He's making an argument, and he's, he's kind of, he's, he's making this, this case, and then he's sort of challenging his own case with some objections, and then he's going to answer those objections. So, well, wait a minute. If this is true, then what about this? Ha, there's an answer to that. That's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 15. So look at verse 16 with me at this question about whether or not the dead are raised. What happens when we die? Do we just stay in the grave? And he says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep, it's another way of saying have died, those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So, you don't have any hope to be raised. The people have already died. They don't have any hope to be raised. Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, like it ends in the grave and that's it, then we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The resurrection conquers fear of your sinful past. Each one of you has a past that's worth remembering, and each one of you has a past that's worth forgetting. You've done some good stuff. You've, done some, you've had some accomplishments in your life. You've got things that you feel comfortable posting on Instagram, sharing with the world, and then you've got things in your life that you would never be comfortable posting on these screens. Some of us remember our past like it was yesterday, like a seven-year-old getting beat up and getting his jack stolen. Others of us forget a lot about the past. We've just sort of, <laughs> we've gotten amnesia about what's happened. Now, I praise God that we don't remember all the sinful things that we've ever thought, felt, said, or done. I praise God for that. I I shared this once before, but a number of years ago, I randomly ran into, at, at another church, I randomly ran into somebody who I had gone to high school with. The person came up to me and was like, do you remember me? I'm Amy. And the first thing I thought of was, it is very possible that she could have been on the receiving end of something very cruel that I did in high school. I was praying that she did not actually remember and I couldn't think of anything, and so we ended up having a good conversation. But I praise God for sin amnesia. I praise God that we're not just confronted all of the time with all of the things that we think, feel, say, or do. Because that would be overwhelming. But the danger of selectively remembering our past is that we can then live our lives unaware of how sinful we've actually really been. I'm guilty of this. I'm sure you are too. What I'm trying to say is we can erase the sin from our lives. We can sort of like clean up our story looking back, only remember the highlights and then we aren't, in that case, sinners in need of salvation. Now we're just, we're just wanderers on a journey looking for self-improvement. That's a danger of not remembering all of the sin that we've done. If you, and if we redefine who we are in those terms, it then necessarily redefines who God is. Then God is not someone who cares about what you've done or who you are. God is someone who then cares about how you feel. He becomes not a God of moral rights and wrongs, but a therapist God who is, 
who's there to help counsel you, or, or a life coach God who's there to help you have successful living. And what we saw last week when we looked at John 19 and we, looked, we gazed at Jesus dying on a cross for our sins, we saw that that was necessary because God remembers every thought, deed, word, feeling, emotion, everything about us. Just because you can't remember what you said to your friend in elementary school or what you did in high school doesn't mean it's been scrubbed from the hard drive. It is still there. Every last detail of every moment of every worst day of my life and your life is in full view of God in stunning HD clarity. The people that I've lied to, the people that I've used, every angry response that has come out of my house, every reckless moment where I just disregarded God's words, all of it is in technicolor before the righteous throne of God right next to yours. God sees it all. And he's made this thing inside of us called a conscience. He's made this conscience to work a bit like a trick candle where you blow it out and it comes back and we, we seem to blow out the, the guilt and the shame of our past. We kind of just bury it, don't want to deal with it, we want to move on and then our conscience just keeps bringing it back up. And we need to either keep squishing it back down to keep going, or we've got to figure out a way to deal with the regrets and the pain and the broken relationships of our lives. Some of you are dominated by your past. Some of you are just dominated to the point where it's destroying your present. And at the heart of the gospel, through Jesus, we see that there is a way, and not only a way, it is the way. This is the way. A way to be forgiven, a way to be pardoned for our sins, a way for the disgrace that you felt and feel when you do something sinful and wrong, a way for that to be lifted off of your shoulders and put on Christ. There is a way to find cleansing and healing and pardon, and we could not make it ourselves. And so God sent Jesus to become the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus offers himself to us. That's why he came as a bridge between a chasm that we could not cross, between God and man, as he sacrificed himself on the cross. On the cross, the cross is upright, but it acts like a bridge between man and God. As Jesus willingly hangs by the nails in his hands and his feet, he bears the full weight of wrath of God for our sins. And if you remember from last week, when Jesus says on the cross, it is finished, he's not just talking about the physical pain of, of suffering in his body, he's talking about the atonement. He's talking about God's wrath having been fully poured out upon him. Listen, God's wrath will either be poured out upon Jesus on the cross, or it will be poured out upon you on the final day. Those are the only two options. And we see here on the cross, the beauty of the cross amidst all of the horror of the cross is that our sin was not overlooked, our sin was not forgotten, our sin was not squished down and buried, our sin was dealt with in punishment on Jesus. That's the cross. Jesus was judged to the point of death on a cross. We even sang it together this morning. Amazing love that sent his son to suffer in my stead, in my place. The sinless king who died for me, the cross, he died for me when I deserved his death. But, but if Jesus stays dead, then we have no assurance that our sinful past has been forgiven. If Jesus says dead, then he's a false prophet. He said, destroy this body, this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. If he doesn't rise, he's a false prophet. He's no better than any other human you know, teacher or like guru or anyone you'd go to for some kind of counsel, except for he's wrong. His death was not enough. There had to be a resurrection. That's what Paul's saying. If the dead aren't raised, we don't have any confidence that Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is futile. You're still dead in your sins. 
You've got nowhere to go with them. There's no bridge. There's no chasm. You walk up to the edge, the end of your life, and you fall over into the pit. Without the resurrection, there would be no verifiable proof of God's payment for our sins, that that check was cash. And so all of our hopes for forgiveness hinge on God accepting that payment. If that doesn't happen, then we're damned. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. No hope. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Do you see that? When you call yourself a Christian, you're either one of two things. You're either entering into the most glorious, the most wonderful, the most majestic, the most mind-blowing and incomprehensible glory that's ever ever been known by anyone, the promise of eternal life, the promise of forever joy, you're either entering into that or you are most of all the peoples in the world to be pitied. So like line up the groups, line up the different peoples and put yourself at the very, very back of the line. It's one or the other. There's really no in between. Has Jesus been risen from the dead? That's the question. And he says in verse 20, but in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The resurrection is the proof that the check has cashed, that the check has cleared the bank. The resurrection conquers the fear of your sinful past. Listen, not by denying its ugly infestation, not by denying its existence, but by proclaiming God's victorious judgment over it. God's victory is over your sinful past. Now, here's some evidence of that victory. There was a tomb. There were soldiers guarding the tomb. There was a two-ton stone in front of the tomb, and it's empty. There were 500-plus eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. There were personal testimonies from all of the disciples, these men who were, who were fearful on Saturday. Lives radically changed, missionaries mobilized, an entire world turned upside down. Our, our whole calendar has been changed because of this Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the most documented events in ancient history. And if you read the book of Acts, it's the main message that the Apostle Paul preaches as he travels and plants churches. He goes into these towns, he goes in these places, and he, he says, this is the news, this is the way. Jesus has risen from the dead. That's it. That's the message. Paul here calls it a fact. It's a fact. It's a historic fact. And all of that relates to us like this. If you come today with your past exactly as you are, you don't have to do anything yourself, all of your failures, all of your mistakes, all of your sin, all of your junk, all of your baggage, and you come to God and you say, Lord, you take my life, you take my past, I'll take yours, we'll exchange. God promises to forgive you and save you and cleanse you. He promises to remake you into his image. He promises to raise you from the dead on the last day. God's word is true, friends. He promises you these things. So if your past is speaking louder to you, than the resurrection. You need, to, you need to lower the voice that's inside of you. You need to let the voice of, of the resurrection be amplified. Don't let your shameful past tell you there's no hope for you. Don't let your past tell you that you're permanently broken. Don't let your guilty conscience convince you that God won't accept you anymore. Don't let those fears keep you from bringing yourself to the cross. And that's not just for those who don't know Christ and aren't believing him now. That's for you, Christian, who sin. Don't let it don't let it derail you. Keep running the race. Keep putting your faith in Christ because the resurrection is true. Can I get an amen? And the resurrection speaks great hope into our sinful pasts. We don't have to clean ourselves up. God cleans us through the cross. So we have nothing to fear when we stand before God as it relates to our sins. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It doesn't just deal with our past, though. The resurrection also conquers the fear of an unknown future. 
what will this year hold? What will the next year hold? What will the next decade hold? What will your life hold? I think the scariest thing about the future is that we have no idea what it will hold. Right, like think about this. If you knew exactly what was gonna happen and if it was good, you wouldn't have any fear because you'd know what's gonna happen. You're gonna have fun. You're gonna have joy, pleasure and enjoyment. We're all terrified that the possibility of things happening in the future that are heartbreaking, heart aching, painful, are right there alongside the hope of joy. Why do we do that? Why do we, why do we project into the future? There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be problems. Why don't we think that the future is going to be apple pie and ice cream? Why, why do we do that? Well, I think it's obvious. We look around our world and we see what's happening and we see heartache and we see heartbreak and we see pain and we see the futility of life. We see people who have worked their entire lives to build their small business and within the scope of one year, an invisible virus shoots across the world and triggers economic panic and they're out of business. We've seen it. We've seen what happens when you work to try to get to retirement so that you can enjoy your later years and then you get right to the edge of retirement and you get diagnosed with some kind of crippling disease that destroys your body. We've seen it. You work your whole life to build your wealth so that you can then at the end of your life give it over to somebody else who's going to spend their whole life trying to build their wealth to give it to somebody else and so on and so on. We've been studying Ecclesiastes as a church it's no wonder that the preacher cries, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. Life is meaningless if it ends in the grave. <laughs> and listen, if that's our future, if the grave is our future and no more, the grave doesn't care whether or not you made CEO. The grave doesn't care that you never got married. The grave doesn't care that you missed the shot in the big game. The grave doesn't care about your accomplishments and your achievements. None of that matters to the grave. The grave gets what it wants every time, and it destroys our hope for the future in the process. The future is scary because we know how this game plays itself out. Death never strokes your ego. It's brutal, it's unflinching, and it's relentless in its pursuit of us. So think about the disciples on that Saturday. They're shell-shocked on that Saturday after the cross. This man they followed for three years who said he was the Messiah, he was the Christ. He's dead, he's cursed, he's hung on a tree. Now their lives are going where? Their future is probably going to be much like his. And so the gospel portrays these men as scared, huddling together, doors locked for the fear of the Jews. They're just cowering in fear of what the future is going to hold. Because with Jesus dead, the future seemed very bleak, and very small. And I want to suggest to you that in many ways, that's the way that we look at life. Our future so often looks small and bleak, and we look with trepidation at what the future holds, and we begin to cower, and we begin to shake. But friends, we're gathered together here in this room and online as maybe fearful saints, and as we do, we hear the pages of the scriptures begin to tell a new song. A new story, a beautiful sound, a sound of a stone that's rolled away, the sound of the curse of death being conquered by a risen lamb, the sound of eternity with God being secured forever. We hear a voice proclaiming to us, behold, I am making all things new. We hear the sound of an army stomping on the battleground and trampling death itself underfoot. We hear the sound of an orchestra, the most beautiful sound that an orchestra can produce as the sound of the future that's coming, as the power of God begins to unwind all that sin has previously destroyed. That's what the cross is doing. You see those shows where they show you the show and then they rewind it and you see it all go backwards? That's what the cross is doing. God is remaking all things new through Christ. We see now in verses 21 through 26, Paul says, for as by one man, a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, 
Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This first fruits he's talking about here is the first part of the crop. As the crop grows up, the first part that says the crop is coming. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. It's like when you go to the barbecue restaurant and they cut off the first part of that burnt end. There's more behind that. It's coming. The resurrection guarantees your future resurrection. That's what the first fruits does. Listen, it tells us this. Here's what it tells us. I hope you're listening. I hope you get this. It tells us this. Nothing can stop our God. That's what it says. The resurrection tells us that nothing can stop our God. Yeah, but what about, no, Jesus is going to crush all of our enemies. He's going to crush sin and Satan and sickness and death once for all. There's nothing that can stand in his way. And then he's going to hand us over as the church as a prize to God. He's going to say, here, Dad, here's what I've won for you. Here's your prize. And he's going to deliver us to the Father. Because the resurrection is true, we know this is true. We will be resurrected. But you might ask, will that ever change? Can something change that? Can something, can something take that away? Can that hope be lost? Flip over to Romans chapter 8 just for a moment. Romans 8, it'll be on the screen also. Romans 8, one of the most beautiful sections of all of Scripture. Paul is building on the logic of the gospel. And what he's doing in Romans 8 is he's giving us total assurance that we are safe with God, that nothing can separate us from him, not our past, not our future, not our present. He says in verse 34, as he's kind of getting into the argument here, he says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. So who's going to condemn you if Christ has died for you? More than that, who was raised? There we are, resurrection. Who was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So the past is dealt with. There's no condemnation. He's died for us. He's risen for us. He's at the right hand. He's even praying for you right now. So that's not going to change. But what about the future, Paul asks? What shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35. What shall come and rip us apart? Shall tribulation, like the kinds we've experienced in the last year, or distress? Shall persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He's saying life Life feels like we are just handed over to death. It's all these different ways in which we feel trials and tribulations and suffering. It's like we're just being killed over and over again. Is that, is that grounds to lose God's love? If we're experiencing those things? Verse 37, no. In all these things, in them, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That is unbelievable. The word here for conquer can be translated super triumph. You are a super triumpher, if that's even a word, in all of your sufferings. Like he's saying, you could be in the middle of a boxing ring, you could be bloodied and on the ground and struggling to get up, and it looks as if everything is lost, and actually, you're triumphing in that moment by faith in Christ. You are learning how to trust God. You are learning that his faithful love will never let you down. You are, you are learning how, how he alone takes the horrors of this world and redeems them into something good. When you've been the recipient of God's great and amazing love in Christ, you're not just surviving. You're not just enduring. You've won. You're a victor. You're a super triumpher. So your job isn't what you want it to be. Your health, not what you want it to be. Your friendships aren't what you want them to be. Your holiness isn't where you'd like it to be. Your marriage is not what you expected it to be. Your children are not as perfect as you wanted them to be. Your dreams aren't being fulfilled the way that you hoped that they would be. Your longings aren't being renewed the way you pray for them to be. Your strength giving out, you feel like quitting, you feel like giving up. 
Brothers and sisters, that is where God does his best work. In the suffering. That's where the super triumphing happens. It's not on the billboards or at the Hollywood parties. It's in his love for his people in any and all circumstances. His love is like divine super glue. When Jesus dies and is raised, his love is attached to you, believer, and nothing can separate you. He will carry you, strengthen you, fight for you, and love you all the way through death's door into the glorious rivers of heaven so that you can face your future, not, the, not an unknown future that's fearful and, and trepidatious, but a confident future, a certain future where you know everything works out in the end. That's the promise of the gospel. So what can man do to you if that's the case? What can, what can this world do to you if that's the case? What is, on your list, what is the worst thing that can happen to you? Die. Die kick over Easter flowers on Easter Sunday. That was embarrassing. That wasn't on my list until just now. What's the worst thing that could happen to you? Suffering? Cancer? Famine? Persecution? The sword? COVID? What's the worst that can happen to us if at the end, if God brings us through the veil into everlasting life and everlasting joy with him. What's the worst that this world can do to us? Nothing. Can't touch us. Now that doesn't mean that we're not to live wisely in this fallen world and not to be stewards of the life that we've been given. Of course we are. But what can death take away from you if God has transformed it into a gateway to glory? Nothing. That's his point. Verse 38 for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us, that super glue bond, separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can do it. You are perfectly safe in the arms of God forever. J.R.R. Tolkien tries to capture the sense of wonder. At the end of the return of the king, as Samwise has destroyed the ring at Mount Doom, after he comes to from his great sleep, and he's surprised by Gandalf. Gandalf says, well, Master Samwise, how do you feel? But Sam lay back and stared with open mouth, and for a moment, between bewilderment and great joy, he could not answer. At last he gasped, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? A great shadow has departed, said Gandalf. And then he laughed. And the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. And as he listened, the thought came to Sam that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment, for days without count. It fell upon his ears like the echo of all the joys he had ever known. But he himself burst into tears. Then as a sweet rain will pass down a wind of spring and the sun will shine out the clearer, his tears ceased and his laughter welled up. And laughing, he sprang from his bed. How do I feel, he cried. Well, I don't know how to say it. I feel, I feel, he waved his arms in the air. I feel like spring after winter and sun on the leaves and like trumpets and harps and all the songs I have ever heard. Tim Keller wrote, everything sad is going to come untrue and it will somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost. Oh, friends, isn't this miraculous? Embracing the Christian doctrines of the incarnation and cross brings profound consolation in the face of suffering. The doctrine of the resurrection can instill us with a powerful hope. It promises that we will get the life we most long for, but it will be an infinitely more glorious world than if there had never been the need for bravery, endurance, sacrifice, 
or salvation. Resurrection conquers fear of an unknown unknown future because we know exactly what the future holds. And third and last, the resurrection conquers fear of our painful present. Because you're like me. You're here right now. You don't know when that day is coming and you've got to live between now and then for the glory of God. So what do we do about the now? How do we keep pressing on? How do we keep focused? How do we not lose heart? Well, Paul ends chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians in this magnificent way as he takes all that the resurrection is and all that the resurrection means for the past and for our future and he brings it together in this charge in verse 58 for our present. Therefore, my beloved brothers, therefore, on the basis of all of this, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord... Your labor, your work, your efforts are not in vain. The resurrection conquers fear of the painful present because it tells us that our work is not in vain. That we're to abound in the work of the Lord with all of the bumps and bruises, with all of the heartaches and disappointments and sacrifices. The resurrection tells us it is worth it. It's worth it. It's not in vain to follow Christ. It's not in vain to follow Christ if you're a mom and dad. It's not in vain to battle to teach your kids how to love holiness. It's not in vain to battle against discouragement and disappointments when they sprout up on on every side. God's using all of it. Watching the flowers. God's using all of it. Working together this incredible future for us. Every moment of difficulty is preparing for us the glorious future that awaits us. In fact, 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, for this present, meaning this present moment, this light and momentary affliction that all of us walk in, it is achieving for us. It is achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. All of your suffering is working together as an achievement to get the glory that God has for us in heaven. That means that it's worth it to follow Jesus. It will not be for nothing that you get up for another round and another year and you battle for faith in Christ. That you battle to love your wife the way Christ loved the church. That you battle to pray for your son or daughter who's going off the deep end into sin. That you battle to share your your, your stuff with people who need it. God promises us even in the now, he's given us resurrection power to make us steadfast and immovable. I want to just draw your attention to, to one last thing here. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, the same power of the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives inside of you if you're a Christian. You have resurrection power inside of you to battle loneliness, to hold your tongue when you want to complain, to push forward against, in, into holiness, to, to resist suicidal promises of sin, to seek the face of God, to obey his word, and to endure suffering, and to be steadfast and immovable until the day you die or the day Jesus returns. Hallelujah, make it quick. When we taste the heavenly glory on that day, I can just tell you this for a fact with the truth of the scripture. There will be no tears. There will be no fears. There will be no regrets. There will only be the sweet reward of Jesus. I want that. It'll be the best Easter celebration anyone has ever known. When you will see on that day all that your life has truly accomplished. So why does the resurrection matter, friends? The resurrection matters because it conquers every ultimate fear, past present, and future. We're going to take communion in just a moment, but if you don't know Christ, then let me tell you, you have yet to experience this abundant life that God offers you. You have yet to experience the real life. Jesus came to give life and life abundantly, and I would just ask you this morning to trust in the cross, trust in the resurrection, trust that Jesus is the way. Turn your life to him. And if you know Christ and you trust in his work for you, then you can be assured today that he covers your past, he covers your future, he's with you in the present, speaking peace and purpose, even on this resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you with our hearts full that our past cannot stop your grace, our present 
It's filled with your Spirit's power. Our future is assured. What can man do to us? What can the world do to us? Oh God, give us wisdom to live our lives with courage and with faith and with prudence and with wisdom as we seek not our own good but the good of others so that your name would be glorified, that you would draw glory to yourself. Lift Jesus high through our lives. Draw men to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.